Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. I am your host, Andrew J. Polk. Thank you for tuning in, however you may be doing so, in the many social media pages and otherwise live streaming options that we have these days. Of course, on air, online, live streaming through the free and reliable iHeartRadio app or over on our social media pages. Again, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. Find us other some combination of El Paso History, El Paso History Radio Show, or Andrew J. Polk. And of course, today is October 15th, Saturday, and we are talking about the history of the 1st Cavalry Division on Fort Bliss, including its organization, of course, a little bit of the history of mounted combat, so to speak, in the region, and of course, how the technology has changed over the years and, well, how it exists today, even within the region. So, of course, you can find us on all those places that I mentioned, ktsmradio.com, specifically the website where you can stream us around the world as long as you got internet and full video on the El Paso History radio show Facebook page and YouTube channel as well as shared and double checking on it this week over on our partner Facebook group Remember in El Paso When and this is of course the place where we say Texas history begins in El Paso we do have a history moment at the start of hour two on the program from documentary filmmaker Jackson Polk this week talking about the A on the mountain and some of the activities involving it but here with us in studio today, we are joined by uh, John Hamilton, military historian in the region. Thank you very much for joining us today. It is good to be here with you again. Andrew. Absolutely. Glad to Excellent. have you back on. It's been, it's been a minute. So yes. checking on some of the other interesting topics and research you've gone into, I don't think many people would be wrong in thinking that, well, don't we have kind of, you know, mobility considered in at least modern military terms, Fort Bliss? I mean, of course, Fort, Fort Bliss, and as it is now known, home of the 1st Armored Division. Right. And so, you know, the things that armor and that come with them, often mobility is a very important concept for those who are interested in those kind of things, which includes me. But of course, the history, if you kind of want to draw it back a little bit of the idea of mobility as kind of a key concern within combat capabilities in the region has quite the long history and technically stretching into kind of prehistory, but specifically in some of the research that you've done, it's... Well, the 1st Cavalry Division is what we're going to be focusing on today, but uh, of course the the history even before that point is interesting in its own right in our region. That's right. Um, Let's start with a poem. There is this mystical association of man and horse with a cavalry, and Mm -hmm. uh, this came out uh, quite evidently when, when the cavalry was here. So let's read a poem, Come All Who Are Able... Go down to the stable and water your horses and give them some corn. For if you don't do it, the colonel will know it. And then you will rue it as sure as you're born. So take care of your horses being That's the very right. basic idea. That's right. Not, many, many, not, not a whole lot of people know that the 1st Cavalry Division was formed here at Fort mm-hmm. Bliss, Texas and spent 22 years here. Um, we did have mounted troops here before then. Of course, Fort right. Bliss was in six different places. You mm-hmm. go back to 1849, where 250 soldiers of the 3rd U.S. Infantry came here from San Antonio, uh, left in June, arrived here in September of 1849, mm-hmm. and they brought with them 275 wagons, 250 livestock, uh, and they brought with them also some horses. So of the soldiers that came, mm-hmm. about 100 of them were mounted. But these weren't cavalry. Uh, Uh, The issue with with cavalry didn't come up until much later. Uh, But you needed mounted people to cover the livestock to make sure that the Indians didn't come in and steal them. Ah, okay. So that kind of leaves the natural question then you you mentioned here. What's the difference between mounted and cavalry? Mounted soldiers, uh, you, you hoped that they could ride a horse. They weren't really trained okay. to, serve, to be cavalry. They weren't trained to act together as a team uh, or to fight together. And they weren't armed to, to be cavalry. A uh, cavalry soldier is, is mounted light. Uh, and in, in those days, uh, they carried, the uh, in 1849 at least, they carried uh, the musket that uh, was carried in the Mexican-American War, which was mm. a long rifle. Um but uh, so they arrived here. They, they were here and served as infantry. Uh, the horses, you had to bring horses from the east, and, and horses were kind of hard to sustain here. Hmm. Um, when McGoffinsville was established in 1853, that was established with four companies of the 8th Infantry. So, mm-hmm. so still, even so, 
even with the Indian depredations, uh, you did not have cavalry here. Uh, the troops were expected to guard wagon trains, to guard the posts, to move on foot. And the infantry did that. And most of them marched here. Uh, and you had this huge, long um, supply uh, line between us and San Antonio. Um, and so we have a, one of the pictures up online right now, kind of the showing one of the original maps of the area. We've had some discussion about maps in the past here, but this one looks to have a decent amount of accuracy to it. And one of the interesting parts showing both the, the Simeon Hart area, uh, some of the uh, surveys to the north, and of course just off to the eastern part of the picture, because this isn't exactly a north-south uh, orientation here, but close enough, and it shows the Fort Bliss as it's yes. kind of being got there. And so, would that be the McGoffinsville location? That's being McGoffinsville, there? right up next to the river, and that would cause problems much later. Yeah, uh, yeah. The river was not controlled, and it would change course, mm -hmm. and uh, you could wash away part of the post if you weren't careful. Um, this is true. The, the horses and mules were really required to uh, to move stuff around. Um, but the Congress at the time uh, said, my golly, those are really expensive to maintain. You had to move yeah. all those animals from the east in a herd. Uh, there was no railroad. There, you, you couldn't put them on a wagon. You and had to herd right? them out yeah. here. Um, and without some kind of mounted troops, uh, your opponents, and in this case uh, Indian tribes, could raid at will and then gather livestock. Uh, the infantry can pursue them, but they're not going to catch them. Uh, mounted, injury, uh, mounted Indians could move much faster, and they rode their own ponies that had grown up out here. Right. Uh, as opposed to uh, Western livestock that was used to grain feeding and, and uh, not so much used to just grazing in the grass. Uh, you had a threat of Indian ambush. Mm. So, so really, it was 1856 when we had some of the first mounted troops that came here. This was some an organization called the Regiment of Mounted Riflemen. Okay. Differently, a, a bit different from cavalry or dragoons. We had cav and dragoons out here. Mm -hmm. First and second cavalry regiments were in the frontier, and the first and second dragoons, which were heavier, were also in the area, particularly the second dragoons that was up in New Mexico. But they were spread all over the place uh, in penny packets. Um, and really, they didn't come to Fort Bliss. Uh, the regiment of mounted riflemen carried Mississippi rifles, the long rifles. Okay. They were expected to ride to battle, but then dismount and fight on foot. Uh, as opposed to the dragoons, which carried something called a musketoon, which is a shortened rifle, which the troops hated. Uh, <laughs> if you, mm -hmm. if it was a muzzle-loading weapon, it was a short weapon. It was mm -hmm. inaccurate, and if you didn't seat the round in the in the rifle in the musketoon, if you bent it down the ball would likely roll out and fall out on the ground. Oh, no. So, so uh, not so great. Another term you've used here that people who have done a historical st study, uh, there's been at least one program I think and think of. Uh, I want to say it was a turn, the idea, a program that featured uh, like George Washington spies where the term dragoon came up. So it's appeared in popular media at least once that I'm right. aware, probably more. But just to not confuse people about that, so we've talked about cavalry, we've talked about mounted infantry basically yes. as, as a conveyance to the battlefield and then fight as infantry right dragoons what does that phrase fit uh dragoons were heavier uh they would carry usually heavier weapons uh, they would carry heavy sabers um and but more often than not they were essentially cavalry really what they were i mean the way i guess uh, i can kind of understand is that they could fight competently, if not necessarily expertly or the best, in either way on foot or yes. mounted. Yes. Okay. But the problem out here is that you, you have this enormous territory. Oh, of you've course. Got, you've got troops spread in, in small posts all over the place, one or two companies, and Fort Bliss was li at McGoffinsville was like that. Um, so, but in 1856, you had K Company of the Regiment of Mounted Riflemen that arrived here. Uh, they served here. They fought in an expedition called the Gila River Expedition in 1857, mm. uh, along with other units. Um, and they essentially, most of the regiment of mounted riflemen were in the territory of New Mexico until the okay. Civil War. 
Um, and in fact, uh, we had two battalions that concentrated here and at, at uh, Fort Fillmore at Old Messiah mm-hmm. uh, at the onset of the Civil War. And ultimately, they had to surrender ignominiously to uh, the uh, Texans, uh, the Second Texas Mounted Cavalry under uh, Lieutenant Colonel John Baylor, mm. uh, firebrand, Indian fighter, uh, warrior in the, the Texas Revolution. Uh, Baylor had never really served in the United States Army, though. He's mm. never a federal officer. Uh, and ultimately, in July 1861, uh, the Federals were trying to retreat out of here and out of Fort Fillmore up to Fort Stanton. Mm-hmm. And they were mm-hmm. confronted at St. Augustine Str- Springs by these by 300 mounted riflemen and uh, upwards of 700 infantry and cavalry surrendered mm-hmm. to these mm-hmm. guys. Uh, it was an ignominious surrender. Uh, and it pretty much did away with cavalry here for quite some time. Uh, you had Henry Hopping and Sibley that showed up later on with the Texas Volunteers to enter New Mexico. They were all mounted. Mm-hmm. Some of them were Lancers, uh, which were pretty much outmoded by that time. And I mean, like literally t- taking from that phrase, yes. as in lances. Big, big long poles with, with, uh, with yes, pointy ends. Pointy yeah. ends, that's it. <laughs> okay. And at the Battle of Alverde, they did not hold up well against the federal uh, guns that were there. I would that imagine. pretty much was the end of them. But, but Sibley moved on, was able to move because he was mobile. He had... Uh, um, Horses mm-hmm. captured a bunch of them from the Federals uh, here between here and Albuquerque, but ultimately was defeated in um, Apache Pass and, and or Apache Canyon and Glorieta Pass, uh, and and filtered back here. So after the Civil War, um, the Regiment of Mounted Riflemen returned to the West as the Third Cavalry Regiment, mm-hmm. and exists even today as the Third Armored Cavalry Regiment which is part of the 1st Cavalry Division at Fort Hood. Mm-hmm. But the, the mounted riflemen never came back here. Okay. And, um, I mean, there's a lot of traditions that can be drawn from these here. Again, the idea of mobility being key. I mean, if you want to go back into even in that point in time, but also even further back in history, the idea of cavalry was as the mobility was key. I mean, that was the entire point here. Like, sure, the amount of later on firepower, but of otherwise, you know, just violence and on a on hoof, so to speak, was the idea of it to disrupt, to be able to move around, to take advantages of enemy formations was kind of the key of it here. But oftentimes you may think like, okay, if that's so awesome, why not then have just everyone on a horse? Because A, expense, time, expensive. training, but also the fact of like taking and holding things. Like if you're trying to hold a position, if mobility is your key, holding is kind of the antithesis of what what makes sense for you there. So that's why you still have infantry and, you know, heavier troops that are able to dig in, so to speak. Infantry occupies and holds terrain. Mm. Cavalry re- reconnoiters, uh, pursues, exploits what the infantry does. So that's the real value of cavalry, mm. particularly organized cavalry. And uh, with the rough terrain that we have out here in the West, uh, mounted cavalry was excellent. It, they performed well. Mm. But here at Fort Bliss, here at McGoffinsville after the Civil War until 1868, mm-hmm. when McGoffinsville washed away, uh, <laughs> uh, this was an infantry post. Camp mm-hmm. Concordia between 1868 and 1877 was an infantry post. Um, the uh, garrison um, uh, the garrison town that we had between 1878 and 1880, mm-hmm. down, downtown El Paso, all infantry. It wasn't until they established uh, Hart's Mill mm-hmm. in 1879, 1880, that uh, one troop of the 9th Cavalry Regiment was stationed at Hart's Mill. Um, but then you had the Victoria War up in New Mexico right. with the Membres Apaches. That put every single cavalry trooper in the field. And you have stories of the pursuits where the 9th Cavalry did a lot of the pursuing, and they would end up on an operation losing all of their horses, all of them. Oof. They would just perish. You couldn't keep them supplied. You couldn't keep them fed. 
uh, water was a problem, and Victorio was moving mostly on foot and was able to move even faster. And that's why the logistics are important about this. But, uh, of course, we got to take that first break of this hour right now. Again, joining us here in studio is John Hamilton, military historian, talking about the history specifically of the 1st Cavalry Division on Fort Bliss and, well, all the history surrounding it and how that even connects, of course, to the modern day. But got to take that first break of the hour right now. Coming out of this break, talking more about this and getting even further into some more of the uh, some of those conflicts that helped develop and influence the development and even how it exists today of the military forces in our area. So stay tuned. More on the El Paso History Radio Show after this break here on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com, 915-440-2140. For souvenirs, gifts, and decor, Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan, near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m1ep.com. To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549, 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. We are, of course, the El Paso History Radio Show on Facebook. You can go there for our weekly promo announcements of the topics on the program each and every week. Plus, you can go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, where you can, again, find our archives there. It's a little bit better of a location for those of you who don't have, like, a, a login elsewhere. YouTube's a little bit friendlier for that. But, of course, you can also find the full series of El Paso Gold History DVD 
DVDs covering more than the last couple of decades of history production and topics developed here in town, plus a lot of other things, including the 20 different series of El Paso history uh, TV segments produced for KBIA, but I've had a hand in on the back end myself. So a lot of content out there. Whatever works best for you, go ahead and find that. And a reminder to support our advertisers. I'll be headed out after the program today after our airing to Pepe's Restaurant in Canutillo. Open for in-house dining at 6761 Donovan Drive. They do have some hours changing during the week. So if you've got any questions about when they're open and available, definitely open this Saturday. I'll be there. But you can give them a call at 915-877-2152. 915-877-2152. Home of the one and only margarita and, of course, all of the the, I would call, argue, historic Griggs recipes, still keeping those traditions alive here. So if you remember that or that name means significance to you, you'll definitely appreciate what they got going on for you over at Pepe's. Again, 6761 Donovan Drive. But again, joining us here in studio today, we do, of course, have John Hamilton, a military historian, talking about the history of, well, kind of been delving into cavalry in general in the area or the idea of mounted force, military forces, but specifically focusing today overall on the first cavalry division on fort bliss so we've been popping up some pictures for those of you who have been watching over online including of course uh, some maps of el paso at the time when uh, fort bliss as seen on the far right hand side of this map was at the mcgoffinsville area and then of course we do have a, a picture from the time that is uh i mean if you would be thinking it's a little bit ramshackle considering what you might consider fort bliss today i wouldn't necessarily blame you, but it looks like uh, I think in the foreground there you can just kind of see what looked like to be livestock of some kind. Even it's a little bit hard to kind of it delineate. It is. That's all adobe. Uh, it was, uh, as you know, adobe is. It tends to be rather fragile when you get you get air uh, mm-hmm. or uh, mm-hmm. when you get uh, rain and and environmental conditions in general tend That's, to degrade yeah, it. yeah the the uh but they did need to need corrals and places to store livestock at uh, mcgoffinsville and mcgoffinsville was a pretty important post uh at the time mm. um and then we moved on we we end we we ended up the last segment we were talking about hart's mill of course uh, mm. hart's mill closed in 1893 when the post moved up to lenoria mesa Right, and it was still an infantry post from 1901 until 1912. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of cavalry there, but when uh, in 1899, when all regular troops left Fort Bliss mm-hmm. to go to the Spanish American War, uh, of course, that's when we brought in the Texas uh, Volunteer Cavalry, and we do have a picture of that as well, specifically here. So showing an example of not exactly mounted. It's a uh, if you want to see it, it's a gentleman regarding a yucca. Yes. Uh, well, while well, dismounted off his horse, but here's on- here's Corporal Owens in his field equipment, uh, part of the Texas Mounted Cavalry. Uh, the vol- he's volunteer, and you can see he's uh, wearing a blue shirt and uh, light blue trousers. They haven't gone to khaki uniforms yet, hmm, and he's okay. still using the 1873 uh, uh, Springfield one shot trapdoor carbine. Oh boy! And th- this is 19 uh, almost into the 1900s. Wow! And that is, I mean that that. That weapon you're referring to on its own here is fascinating in its own right because in some cases they were modified from muzzle loaders, to my understanding. Uh, they were um, they were modified. The early ones were modified from muskets from the Civil exactly. War, mm-hmm. uh, but the later ones were manufactured that way, and and they were very reliable. You mm-hmm. were a single shot. You'd flip open the trap door, ram in a forty five fifty five caliber round, mm-hmm. and you could fire it. But they couldn't hold up against repeaters. Uh, yeah, of course, because action rifles. I mean, sure, you're definitely going to beat the pants off of a muzzle loader, but and I mean, single it, shots. Yeah, this is a black powder weapon. They produced oh, that's a huge true amount of smoke mm-hmm. that you can see where somebody was shooting from. Yes. But after the Spanish American War and the the uh, troops came back, you had this thing that happened in Mexico called the Mexico called the Revolution. Yes, that which... brought cavalry to the border. Uh, in fact, uh, William, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, William Howard Taft, the mm-hmm. president mm-hmm. of the United States at the time, moved almost all of American cavalry to the border 
in, uh, in 19, after 1911. And we'll have to talk more about that in this coming segment, already due for that next break already, keeping on track with our breaks here as much as possible. Again, that's John Hamilton, military historian of the area, talking about some of the history of cavalry and, of course, the 1st Cavalry Division on Fort Bliss. But got to take that next break. So coming out of this break, more discussion on that. So stay tuned here for more on the El Paso History Radio Show on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show, streaming on Facebook where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon-Baney, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com, 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m1ep.com. To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549, 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. A couple of other, of course, our partners and talking about different aspects of local history we want to mention here including of course celebration of our mountains.org that's celebration of our mountains.org they have quite the extensive list of events and items going on including if you missed it today they were doing a tour happening much earlier this morning as we are airing tour of the trinity site in new mexico so Make sure that you're uh, on their list and knowing what the events are coming up so that you can take advantage. I'll make it out one of these days, but uh, it hasn't happened just yet. They do have coming a little bit later this weekend, including a hike to the site of the B-24 crash in the Franklin Mountains and a whole lot more uh, events going on throughout the rest of the season. A whole lot of outdoor events will be happening as we get into those cooler temperatures, including uh, on one coming up a little bit later in October, a visit to the Three Rivers Petroglyph site. But they have a ton of stuff that you definitely want to go and make sure you 
you take a look at, including tours, a lot of natural environment, but just physical representations of our area, including one that's kind of near and dear to me later on in November, a Kilburn Hole volcanic crater. And so check out them. And of course, uh, make sure to check out with our uh, uh, their uh, their events and the many things going on. And of course, joining us here in studio, we are joined by uh, John Hamilton, a military historian of the area, who I do believe uh, I have been to Kilburn's Hole with you back in Boy Scouting oh, days. Oh boy, now you're getting back into <laughs> history here. Exactly. Yes, we've been to Kilburn's Hole. <laughs> yep. And that was some years ago. I'm not going to say yes. how many, but uh, I mean, that's been, it's a beautiful site to visit. If it's not that hot, it makes it even better. Right. So that's why that's in November, among other things right. here. But, of course, we're talking about the history of the 1st Cavalry Division as the focus on the program today. And so we were talking about kind of some of the early history of actual, you know, military forces present in the area, at least in terms of the, in the United States sense, both in terms of, you know, the pre-Civil War area up to, into it, and then into the early part of, uh, well, nearly the uh, beginning of the previous century. And of course, there was a lot of upheavals that came along with it. I mean, it's oftentimes tempting when people think about, you know, global and impacted conflicts for a lot of focus to happen on the world wars. And there certainly was implications of it here. But locally, of course, the uh, Mexican Revolution and the ongoing conflicts that happened there, the United States was by no means uh, ignorant or ignoring any of those conflicts. Oh, no, not at all. Uh, the As I mentioned earlier, there were 11,000 cavalry that were spread out along the border mm. uh, after uh, Ciudad Juarez was taken in 1911. Uh, a brigade of infantry, two infantry uh, regiments, were brought here from uh, from California, commanded by Brigadier General John J. Pershing. Mm-hmm. And you might think, okay, well, now that's infantry. But we also had the 4th Cavalry Regiment that was here. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is a picture here of the 15th Cavalry Mm -hmm. that was brought here um, to cover the border. And uh, uh, so we had, uh, uh, ultimately, you had the raid on Columbus uh, that was done in 1916. And the Army then constituted what amounted to a division, 10,000 soldiers, including the 7th, the 10th, the 13th, and ultimately also the 11th Cavalry Regiment's that went into Mexico to try to chase down Pancho Villa. Now, so, so the picture we're looking at right here, I would say that looks like it might be along San Jacinto Plaza. Yes, it is. And That's I, exactly where it is. And it looks like, if I'm not mistaken, the background, that would be the Mills building. Yes. That looks like. So we'll be looking more or less kind of to the west yes. in downtown if you're essentially at what was a— uh, I'm forgetting the building that no longer exists there at the uh, kind of a southeastern corner of the right. the Muir building, actually, or what was previously kind of looking from there towards the Mills building along that sure. street there, showing it just kind of wall to wall and shoulder to shoulder cavalry with uh, citizens uh, kind of crowded along the very, edges there. Very impressive, very glamorous. There mm-hmm. they are, the whole regiment parading in in uh, in downtown El Paso. And then they were spread along the border from here down into the Big Bend. Absolutely. And so another picture here, and this one uh, we have is of the 7th Cavalry Division returning from Mexico in 1916. The that... much vaunted 7th Cavalry, and, Gary Owen. And looking at the mountains in the background there, I'm going to say that this would be in kind of what we, I guess, would now, the east side of the mountains, but more in like the what we now call the central area. Yes, which was yeah. kind of on would be leading to Not, Lenoria Mesa and where Fort Bliss is and today. Where Fort Bliss was yes. After the U.S. declared war uh, in Germany, uh, of course the units were pulled out of Mexico, and uh, mm-hmm. all of these cavalry regiments they had to have a place to put them. So the Seventh and the Fifth Cavalry regiments were actually placed here at Fort Bliss and constituted as a Second Cavalry Brigade. The Eleventh and the Thirteenth Cavalry regiments were also there for a very short period of time. And then included later on, a little bit later on, was the 82nd Mounted Field Artillery, mm, which okay. was brought in here. They lived on a place called Camp Stewart. Uh, you'd know it now as Underwood Golf Course. Huh, okay. They were in tents <laughs> and temporary wooden buildings uh, in these in a really dusty atmosphere, but very well organized, very well laid out. Okay. Um, and after the punitive expedition, all 17 active cavalry regiments were on the border with the exception of one regiment that was in Hawaii, of all places. Hmm. And most cavalry regiments stayed on the border all through World War One, 
broken up to packets and temporary posts. You even had a division constituted here, the 15th Cavalry Division that was formed. Pershing was a cavalryman himself. Mm -hmm. He wanted a cavalry division as a mobile reserve. Uh, So you had the 1st Cavalry Brigade was organized at Fort Sam Houston. 2nd Cavalry Brigade was here. 3rd Cavalry Brigade was at Douglas, Arizona. Their mission was to prepare for France and patrol the Mexican border. But this this divisional organization didn't work out very well. It was hard Hmm. to control. Uh, communications weren't very good. Ah, uh, that's true. They only the army only sent two cavalry regiments to Europe at, at all, uh, strictly as a reserve. They were they did patrol and courier duty, and they never served in the trenches. So the rest of the yeah. cavalry all through World War One was here. On I the mean, border. it makes a level of sense. Again, speaking of popular media, as a part of that, uh, the movie War Horse out uh, yes. a few years ago kind of gives a decent depiction of how there were many early considerations about how you know military conflicts were evolving at that point in time but of course the bogging down of trench warfare and many of the depictions that have happened of that doesn't really lend itself to uh, the mobility that is inherent but not the protection of cavalry yeah it didn't work you couldn't charge into entrenchments with interlocked machine guns and via learned this in leon in uh, Celaya, Uh, in Mexico in 1915, where he tried this and was cut to pieces. Uh, So there there are lessons here. They're not being learned, really. Yeah. But still, uh, you still had, until 1920, you still had the revolution in Mexico. You still had banditry. You had uh, raids across the border. So the cavalry was deemed to be in the right place, even though... Well, they missed the war, which some would say, given the horrors of the trenches, was not a bad thing. <sighs> yeah, depending on your perspective here, if, if you were going to be the one in the trenches or anywhere near them, yeah, missing or uh, being left out may not again be seen as a bad thing. But a lot of cavalry officers, senior officers, served as infantry commanders in World War One, And some of them, when they came back, had had this experience. But in the meantime, you had the cavalry here, and of course, after World War I, we had uh, Cavalry Brigade on Fort Bliss, and you had the Battle of Juarez in 1919, which we've mm-hmm. talked about on this program. We have. I think that was the previous time we had you um, on, in which uh, cavalry crossed the border in order to uh, dispense with some uh, of the conflict going on there. Yes, and this resulted in sort of a reassessment of the troops on the border and what they should be and where they should be. And as a result of that, uh, we brought in for the very first time, aviation. The first Aero Squadron mm-hmm. came mm-hmm. to Fort to Biggs Army Airfield from San Antonio, and they would fly border missions in these ramshackle aircraft. Uh, I mean, like the Havilland DH4s were called uh, flying coffins. I mean, literally made out of wood and canvas, canvas. in a lot of cases. Exactly. Yeah, and and this was these air, aircraft were obsolete. Uh, the aircraft they used that were used in Europe were far more advanced. But, That's uh, true. But this brought about a sort of a reassessment as where we w- as to where we would go. Mm-hmm. So, and by 1921, there were some decisions being made at uh, army level. Uh, they were. Uh, it was realized that a lot of these penny packet uh, posts all over the West were obsolete, no longer used, no longer needed, and many of them were simply abandoned. Uh, the army closed up shop and marched away. I mean, uh, our, our our territory around here, we've talked about them in previous, previous shows, yes. about the many little, again, posts all along this area, including, you were mentioning Messiah, you know, points uh, a little bit to the east here. Fort of Davis. Fort Davis, yes. uh, you know, Fort Selden, all these different areas that had, I mean, they were service at the point here because, like, as you were mentioning, communication was not as available. I mean, it wasn't even until particularly, you know, the advent of the Civil War and even really uh, until much after that, that it was really integrated in the yes. area with it, with, you know, the ability to have electronic communications. I mean, yes. we didn't even have semaphores in the area. So being able to communicate from one part to the other would have been reliant on, well, someone on horseback. Yes. So here we are in the 1920s. The frontier is long closed. It was closed in 1899 mm-hmm. by the census, who, who said we now have more than two people per square mile living in the frontier, in the far frontier. So the frontier, according to the Census Bureau, said is closed. 
Huh. Um, and World War I ended November 1st, 1918. Uh, there were some troops that, were, that stayed there on occupation uh, duty, but most came home and most were discharged. Mm. Um, the Indians are long pacified. They're moved on to reservations. They no longer pose a threat out here. A lot of the West was still undeveloped, uh, though. We had few roads. If you weren't near a railhead, mm -hmm. then you were pretty much out in uh, the hinterlands. Um, and towns were still relatively widely separated from e each other. And most towns, most substantial towns, were on rail lines. Uh, or at least the ones that uh, continued on in any case. So the Army then looked at the experience in World War I and decided we can, we should really consolidate all of these posts. We should form all of these troops into divisional troops. And that included the, the concept of a cavalry division. And tell you what, leave it there for this moment. we got to right. take that next break right now. Coming out of this break, talk more about how this divisional reorganization, well, led to some uh, changing considerations and, of course, some of the history that we have present here. So stay tuned for more on the El Paso History Radio Show after this quick break here on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom, at Lee Trevino and Pelicano, and see their website at missiondelray.com, 915-440-2140, for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral one epcom To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com.
Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM, mentioning some of our other great partners and talking about eh, different aspects of uh, local history and uh, all of the aspects that go along with it. Talk and Rock Radio, Rick Kern's music podcast can be found talkandrockradio.com, including a, a lot of different uh, episodes that he is going on. He's got quite the archive already over on his website, including a lot of different uh, topics, including uh, talking with Ronnie Cox from Deliverance uh, to his music passion, El Paso rock band music history, El Paso's iconic musical comedy group Springfire, and a whole lot more. You get this a uh, good time to scroll through all of it, including the Border Legends of El Paso tour and remembrances of it. I had a chance to have a hand in the production of that back in the day myself here but again talkinrockradio.com is where you can find all the details on well his exploration of that particular aspect of our history and of course make sure to call patrick total coldwell banker heritage real estate at 915-588-1850 915-588-1850 literally the reason i'm in the house that i am in right now is because of the work of him and his team experts able to help you find and manage properties that you're either looking to own, sell, or again, keep a hold of. He's an excellent realtor to go to for El Paso homes for sale or rent. Find them, of course, 915-588-1850, 915-588-1850. But again, joining us here in studio today, we are joined by uh, John Hamilton, a local military historian, talking about many of the different aspects of cavalry and, of course, the uh, 1st Cavalry Division organized here. We're getting close to the actual organization of the division. But one thing I want to mention here is that, of course, even in the just pre-World War I time, I mean, the use of cavalry, the mobility involved in it was important here. But at least one of the concepts that was kind of playing into right before the division, I mean, because honestly, it would have been maybe not totally un- totally opposable for them to have thought coming out of World War One. well, what, what use does cavalry serve in the wake of, you know, modern uh, firearms and the, uh, you know, the com- relative vulnerability to it? So, uh, we know, why keep them around? But there's also the mythos kind of surrounding it. I mean, there was a just immediately prior American president that had been more or less defined by that. I mean, the Spanish-American War, the charge up San Juan Hill, those kind of things all kind of played into these considerations. Uh, yes. Uh, most of the cavalry that served in the Spanish-American War was pretty much dismounted. They had their horses. In fact, when they got to Cuba, uh, they realized, oh, shucks, oh, dear, we don't really have a way to transport our horses and mules uh, to shore. Yeah, so true. most of them were just dumped off the side of the ship and required, and they, they hoped that they would swim ashore, and most of them did. They got there. Okay. Uh, but you had... At that point in time, the army was starting to transition to smokeless powder. A mm, lot of the European mm. armies already had. And uh, the um, the old Springfield carbines and the Springfield rifles were obsolete. Mm. But but the guard was still using them. So we had transitioned to the Craig Jorgensen uh, rifle and, and carbine, mm. which was the forerunner of the Springfield Model 1903. Ah, uh, which Cra- is then a bolt-action rifle. Yes, mm. yes. Uh, bolt-action, uh, not magazine-fed, but you could put five rounds into it. It mm. was a repeater, uh, had much better range, and um, it was a far better weapon. Uh, but there weren't enough of them to go around. The right. National Guard units, the volunteer mil- units that were mobilized to serve in uh, the Spanish-American War, still had these old uh, Springfield trapdoor weapons. Mm-hmm. Uh, although the, the Rough Riders had the best of everything, oh, of and, course. including a couple of uh, Colt machine guns right. that, uh, that uh, Teddy Roosevelt pretty much purchased himself were those the uh colloquial named uh, potato diggers yes they were yes. you had to mount them on a tripod otherwise they would the uh, the action would dig in literally dig into the ground yeah there was this the reciprocating piece below the That's, barrel that was this kind of swinging piece of metal that yeah if you're on the way uh, up you're gonna have a bad day yeah i would gonna yeah you didn't want to put your hand down there <laughs> certainly not but uh so you had this advance of technology this improvement of range of weapons and accuracy of weapons to the point where by the time you got to the punitive expedition, the Army was uh, using the M1903 Springfields and the, mm. the Colt Model 1911 semi-automatic pistols uh, and essentially 
course, the lancers, the lances are gone. Yeah. And they still have sabers. They have a model 1903 saber, which was modeled after what the French were using, a very heavy affair Mm -hmm. that was designed by a guy named Lieutenant George Patton. Yeah, yeah. Um, (laughs) But even the sabers were obsolete by now. Yeah. Um, I mean, the idea at that point of, you know, riding up to someone and trying to hit them with something. I mean, sure, it's a sword, but still, like that is the idea of that existing even into, you know, the 20th century is a little bit... It, what it, what what's going on here? It, it didn't work. No, These it didn't. things were, in fact, the units that went to the punitive expedition left the, left their army sabers behind, I, except for Patton. We have a picture of Patton. We've seen Patton <laughs> standing in front of his quarters on Fort Bliss, and there in his hand is the saber he designed. <laughs> of course, they're going to hold on to that here. But so yes. some of those questions about you know why keep that around, we'll get into as we again talk about the organization of the divisions and how this transitioned into, well, in the slightly more modern context, but right. we got to take that next break now to get to the top of the hour and the news. So stay tuned for more on the El Paso History Radio Show after this break in the top of the hour news here on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook where you can find archive radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archive pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com, 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m1ep.com. To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549, 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. 
Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. Thank you for tuning in, however, you may be doing so, in the many ways we make available to you all, whether it be on air, online, live streaming through the free and reliable iHeartRadio app, or over on our various social media pages, including Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. Starting out now, hour two of the program with a history moment from documentary filmmaker Jackson Polk talking this week about the history of the A. On the mountain. In the 1960s, I was in a club at Austin High School that took care of the A on the mountain. Each spring, we whitewashed the rocks that make up the A. During football season, we lit the A at the opening kickoff of home games. What did that mean to light the A? Our club put one gallon cans outlining the A about five feet apart. We filled them with sawdust, making a wick up one side. On Friday afternoons of a home game, about 20 of us filled each can with kerosene leaving the wick of sawdust exposed. At game time, about 10 of us lit railroad flares and ran down the mountain touching the flare to each can, which instantly lit up with the flame. You could see the lighted outlined A for miles on the east side of El Paso. The east side stands of the football stadium could also watch the lighting of the A, and the whole crowd would yell loudly, hey, hey, look at the A, which was the large letter outlined in cans of fire. It was an awesome sight. Austin's A was created by two students in 1931, a year after the school opened. Other letters included a J for Jefferson High School, a B for Bowie, an I for Irvin High School, a B with a horseshoe around it for Burgess, and an M for Miners at the college, and a C for Cathedral. Citizens opposing to El Paso's mountain letters caused most schools to remove school sponsorship from the clubs that were whitewashing their letters. At Austin, a group appealed to the student council to remove the A from Mount Franklin. A student told them in the meeting that the A was there before the TV stations, so we would take down the A once the TV station towers were removed. The people were not amused, and they got the school board to ban any school sponsorship. The A is now maintained by alumni volunteers and last was lit for a reunion in 2012. A fire department permit is required, kerosene is now very expensive, and the A has to be put out after lighting up on the mountainside for just a few minutes. It's just not the same. I'm Jackson Polk with this History Moment for the El Paso History Radio Show. Of course, I have to mention some of our other great partners in local El Paso history and promotion, including, of course, the great Facebook group and run by Barbara Given Bainey, operator of the group Remember in El Paso When. You can go there for archive pictures galore. More than 33,000 members at last check. Please remember, the administrators have worked hard in researching for photos with our history attached. So uh, when you use their photos, please give them credit for their site. And, of course, uh, referring there to Chief Admin Owner and Historian Barbara Given Bainey, affectionately known as BGB, plus admins Rick Duncan, Rick Nahara, Margaret D. Smith, and moderators Ben, ben Vincent and Al Lowe. It is no mean feat to keep such a large group on track and focused on the issue at hand without any spam going on. It's something that they work very hard on, so they're always looking for a few good hands to help them with that. So if you want to become part of the moderation or administrative staff, please drop them a line here. But again, join here in studio today as we are talking about the history of the 1st Cavalry Division on Fort Bliss with John Hamilton, a local military historian. And so for people who may have uh, not been paying attention to that part of it, the 1st Cavalry Division, people may be thinking, wait, are you talking about the 1st Armored Division? No, because we are talking about separate organizations, even if there was there is a, a connection in history, at least in the usefulness and the concept behind it. But we are still talking about literally men on horses at this point in time, as we have now reached into the, you know, still first quarter of the 20th century of where we've kind of uh, marked our history to this point. Right. Right. World War One is over. Mm-hmm. World War One, it may surprise people, was considered an aberration by Army senior leaders. Okay. Trench warfare was an aberration. It was unlikely to recur. In, in uh, the future, we would fight a war of maneuver, and to do that, you would need mounted troops. So, we, in fact, they pointed to cavalry experience in Italy and Palestine during World War I to, to support uh, their, their okay. position. Uh, so they had a couple of ideas. We'd have a division of three cavalry regiments, an artillery regiment, and, and support, or two cavalry brigades with two regiments each, a machine gun squadron, artillery, and service units. And that's what they chose. So the original structure envisioned 18,000 or so soldiers, 
that would take wow. up 30 miles of road space, but they cut that down. Um, and ultimately, everything would be horse and mule drawn, except for 14 cars, 28 trucks, and 16 motorcycles. So the 1st Cavalry Division was constituted here in August of 1921. Mm-hmm. Uh, the 2nd Cavalry Division was also constituted but never organized and never manned or never equipped. And it would never be organized, manned, or equipped. Ah, okay. Uh, and so the, here we have one of the original so patches for the 1st Cavalry Division. Here's the patch. And this was designed, they they went through a number of ideas, uh, but this was designed by a lady who was a the wife of a, a colonel in the regiment. And here she is. Uh, let's see, what was her name? Uh, Gladys Fitch uh, Gladys Dorsey. Gladys Fitch Dorsey. And here she is on Fort Bliss on her favorite horse. Mm-hmm. And uh, she was one night cutting up uh, one of her husband's old capes, which was uh, woolen and gold and blue, and decided that she would design a patch. And this is the patch she designed with the horse in the upper right hand corner and the blue stripe. And it was a huge patch, and she wanted it to be big, number one, because you needed to be able to see it on the soldiers uh, operating out in the dust and smoke of battle. And she said this was also a patch uh, designed to celebrate big men doing big things. Okay, I could see it working that way. I mean, it was. I mean, given the fact that we're talking about it, here's one of the first reviews. So of here's the first... a review, 1921, mm-hmm. uh, actually 1922. This was a review on Fort Bliss for the Secretary of War, and uh, you can see uh, every, everything's mounted, although you also, if you look very closely in some of the, this picture, and there are some others, uh, you can see the trucks and motorcycles and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um so the Army constituted, organized this this here, made the division commander the uh, uh, senior leader. His name was Major General Robert Lee Howes. He was a Texas West Pointer. He'd served in the Indian Wars, the Spanish-American War, the Philippine Insurrection, uh, the Punitive Expedition, and he won the Medal of Honor in 1890. Uh, he was born in Texas. Uh, he was married to the daughter of another, uh, of a, former Union Army general in the Civil War, hmm. so and came from a big Army family. Um, and he formed his staff here. Uh, there was one brigade here, the 2nd Brigade, that was constituted here. Um, the uh, other brigade initially was at a place called uh, Camp Harry J. Jones in um, Douglas, Arizona. Okay. Um, and this would have, this had the 1st Cavalry Regiment there, the 10th Cavalry Regiment, and then the two Cavalry Regiments here, the 5th and the 7th, would form the rest of the division. Well, you had a problem. Uh, this was during Jim Crow, and the 10th was a an African-American unit. So there ah. were issues raised with that, um, and ultimately the decision was made to uh, use another regiment that was at Brackettville at Fort Clark as mm-hmm. part of the division, and to move the 1st Cavalry Regiment from uh, Douglas to a place called Camp Marfa. Camp Marfa, that sounds uh, decently close, I suppose. Yes, it is. And you know how they moved them? They moved them on, uh, they essentially packed them up and moved them on horseback. Really? From wow. Douglas to Camp Marfa. It took days to get them there. Yeah, that sounds uh, but, about right. But they had a better training area there. They were closer to Fort Clark that they could train with. So they moved by road march in stages. The kitchens would get up and make breakfast. They'd pack up and leave. The troops would break up the tents and pack up, and then they'd mount horses and move out. Oh, golly, it, it took them days. Uh, I think here's an example. This is technically the uh, 8th Cavalry Supply, but uh, marked as Marfa, Texas, showing uh, what the the supply part of that would have actually looked like uh, even at that point in time, and right? And that's what it was. And it's interesting to note uh, what color are the horses. They're all white. Yeah, that's true. That's because regiments would, uh, as squadrons and regiments would adopt the same color of horses to differentiate between the squadrons and the regiments. Huh, um, Okay. So uh, they went all out to, 
to try to match these horses, and they they essentially did this. Wow! Uh, they got there in January twenty third, nineteen twenty three, um, and essentially set up camp there. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, the Marfa residents. There were about five thousand of them at the time. Marfa mm-hmm. was bigger then. Uh, were most happy to have this this cavalry regiment there. Um, so, uh, with that in mind, in 1923, General uh, Howes decided he wanted to put the whole uh, division in the field to, mm-hmm. t- to test its capabilities. Uh, this was the largest cavalry uh, concentration since the Civil War. We didn't have space around here to do it, uh, mm, so okay. they chose a place in the Big Bend area. Uh, required government, uh, local government and rancher agreement to use the land. Some ranchers agreed, some did not. So between uh, September 10th and October 22nd, the 2nd Brigade and all units at Fort Blitz uh, uh, went on the march and road marched all the way down to uh, uh, the Big Bend. And it was around uh, Shafter, Presidio, Alameda area in the southern part of the Big Bend. Okay. Uh, and they did uh, brigade on brigade exercise. Uh, they did uh, live fire exercise, if you could believe that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then at the end of the exercise, they all got back together for a full day of sports and then a formal review. And the picture you're seeing there of the of the support units that was during the review. That ah, was okay. During the review, so that's why it's at the end they're, of the they're organized. I mean, it's uh, I guess if you were actually doing the road march, it wouldn't be all nicely lined up and uh, right. side by side like that. We're looking at how many covered wagons: one, two, three, four, yes. five, six, seven, eight covered wagons side by side, drawn yes. each by at least uh, two to four horses. How many horses would have been actually drawn uh, each one of those? Should have been. It should have been uh, two or four. Uh, up to six, depending on what they were. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Um, so this they would they did this over 120 square miles. It was great. Wow. There's nobody in in nothing out there, and the only requirement was not to tear down fences, not to ruin water uh, tanks or water ponds. Okay. And uh, and to close the fences that the the gates that they went through. So they were able to say, okay, this is actually a defile when they had to go through a. A uh, fence line through a gate. It was like you had to pass through a defile for the purpose of the exercise. Okay. And and you notice, yes, they're all lined up, column of ducks, all square, and that was the requirement in the cavalry. Everything lined up in order, and in the interwar period between World Wars One and Two, uh, the army was all volunteer, all mm-hmm. spit and polish, and and. But they went through some substantial cuts. And so they all got the division back here. This is an interesting picture that yeah. you just put up there. That was taken here at, at Fort Bliss. Uh, it was uh, the elements of the cavalry division drawn up in the patch, as the patch. So what we're seeing here is the entire 1st Cavalry Division arrayed and laid out so that a picture could be taken of the way they are positioned, including, of course, you can see the, uh, uh, for those looking online, it's essentially making the patch, which is a kind of like a rounded heater shield kind of looking thing, what you might think of if you think of, uh, I think, Captain America's first shield, the one that is, you know, kind of square (laughs) at the top and then wore kind of, you know, sloping and rounded towards the bottom here with a cross in the middle. It's probably only the 2nd Brigade, but the 2nd Brigade would have included two full regiments uh, mm-hmm. The 82nd Field Artillery Regiment that was here, uh, the support units that were here, the signal units, uh, they were all drawn up. And, of course, everybody, everybody is either on a horse or a mule. Yeah, and uh, so, yeah, this taken uh, dated December 14th, 1929, yep. Brigadier General uh, Chaz J. Simmons. And not quite sure, I mean, you could take time to try and count as many people as there are there, but... Honestly, I'm always impressed when they do these kind of pictures, how they did take perspective into consideration. Well, kind of, maybe not as much in this one, because it's more or less still shield-like, even though we got people, I mean, you got to, you can definitely see the guy in front at the tip of the shield, but oh, yes. the rest of it, uh, you start, uh, you just kind of start seeing, you know, dots for heads at the back of it, because it's, you know, a whole, at least brigade, like you're saying. So there's a, there's a lot of people in that picture oh, making yes. up the version, the, the in-person version, so to speak, of the patch. 
Yes. Uh, so this shows regimented life. Uh, a soldier would sign up for three year, four years active service, three in reserve. The average recruit was five feet, seven inches tall, 144 pounds, and the rejection rate was 76% on enlistment. Wow. Everything was based on order, protocol, routine. And regimental commanders were gods. They would uh, pull in their lieutenants. They'd say, set up a writing exercise. I want a prescribed horse jump, uh, this is how we're going to do it. Uh, and the lieutenants then would go back to their regiments, go back to their squadrons, and get with the NCOs and say, hey, I've got this job to do. And the sergeants would say, oh, lieutenant, we've already done that. We know how to do that. And the sergeants would really do all the work and get it all set up. We'll have to talk more about that coming out of this next segment here. Got to take that next break of this hour right now. Again, John Hamilton, military historian, joining us here in studio, talking about the history of the 1st Cavalry Division and kind of cavalry in general in the region. But we'll talk more about how that training, what some of it looked like and what it would be as there was, again, continuing on that organization in the post-war but pre-World War II period. But, of course, we'll talk more about that coming out of this break. So stay tuned. More on the El Paso History Radio Show after this break here on News Radio 690 KTS. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com, 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral one epcom To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. 
Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. Of course, got to tell you what's coming up for you next week on the program. Next week, continuing with our October theming this month, as we are going to be talking with the McGothan Home, of course, about some of the history, traditions, and specifically funerary things going on during well, the Victorian era and many others involving, again, uh, that early part of El Paso's history. So that'll be coming in next week on the program. And son, of course, about the history and and some of the much-vaunted hauntings of the McGothan Home State Historic Site here in El Paso. So stay tuned for that next week on the program. But in the meantime, we, of course, have uh, John Hamilton, military historian, joining us here in the studio talking about the many different aspects of cavalry and specifically the 1st Cavalry Division. And so we've talked a lot about already some of the changes, of course, going from just regiments of you know smaller units. So for those that aren't as well versed with military terminology in this way, when we're talking about regiments, how many individuals is that? And when we're talking about divisions, how many individuals is that? Regiment would have about a thousand soldiers. Okay. Uh, division in this case would have about eight to nine thousand soldiers. Um, and uh, within the regiment, you would usually have three squadrons and each would have uh, uh, as a number of soldiers anywhere from 75 to 150 or, or more. It, and it depended. Uh, in 1921, the Army was cranking up these, uh, the, this cavalry division, but they cut the size of uh, these right. regiments. The regiments used to have 12, um, I'm trying to remember, they used to have 12 troops, they cut them to six troops. Mm. So the numbers went way down very fast. And it's well to remember in 1921, this is sort of the onset of the Great Depression. No, yeah, And true. this was during, and interestingly enough, this was during Prohibition. So, and we'll, we'll talk about that ah, in, in a uh-huh. few minutes. Absolutely, Aaron. Of course, we're in the, you know, intercession between the two wars yeah. at this point. Of course, they at the, that point in time didn't know that. But some of the questions about, okay, you know, mobility, firepower, protection, armor, because, yes. of course, people may be thinking, well, didn't tanks make their appearance during World War I? And, well, of course, that was the code name at the time oh, yes. here. But uh, it was still kind of a, well, hadn't been totally adopted. And, of course, you have to consider the differences between the European and the American model. The Americans were very much interested in fire and maneuver, as you were talking about, yes. being able to maneuver it, whereas, you know, such concepts as, like, the, the Maginot Line were getting developed in Europe. So some of the interplay between these— will show up, and it will <laughs> show up pretty dramatically. But in the meantime, in the barracks, mm. if the regimental commanders were gods, sergeants were lesser gods. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. And you've got an ex- this. Sh- shows the interior of one of the barracks on Fort Bliss Mm -hmm. at the time. And you can see how they lived. Open bays, wall lockers, foot lockers, and bunks. Um, I I read a a story about a first sergeant of H Troop 5th Cavalry, uh, first sergeant William Wolf, W-O-O-F, Glass. Okay. At the noon meal every day, he would announce, I want you people to understand that I'm the first sergeant of H Troop. And that meant he was fully in charge. And at one point, one morning, there was a troop that had gone berserk and was shooting up the barracks with his Springfield rifle. The rifles were in the barracks, and they had live ammo. Hmm. Well, Wolf snatched the rifle away, knocked the soldier out with uh, the butt of the rifle, then calmly turned to the remaining soldiers and said, all right, all right, you people hurry up and get ready for inspection. Keep going. <laughs> and you okay. and you cleaned. You cleaned the barracks, the bathrooms, personal equipment, yourself. You bathed two times a week, and other times you washed your face, your hands, your teeth. You shaved clean, your hair was trimmed, and you wore a spotless uniform with highly polished shoes and leather or clean canvas leggings. You were not ready for inspection unless you could see the reflection of your rifle stock in your shoes and the reflection in your shoes of your rifle stock. And Mm. then you mucked out stables. You know, a horse will produce 40 (laughs) pounds of manure a day. Oh, yeah, that's true. So you mucked out the stables and you mucked them out and you mucked them out even more. And the stables were virtually spotless. You had to have horseshoes. Of course. Every soldier carried horseshoes in in his saddle. And Fort Bliss ran a horseshoeing school. And here is an 8th Cavalry horseshoer in, uh, at his forge in, in one of the regiments, in one of the squadrons on I just want to point out the kind of juxtaposition of what we saw in the barracks photo, which would look, 
I mean, recognizably military barracks even to this day here, even if it doesn't have like a, they're the single bunks, not the double decker bunks, as people may see from, you know, more yeah, modern photos or modern depictions of it here. Even then, uh, training on ranges, it was actually yes. a 22 range here. And even uh, some of the maneuver areas that would be seen, you know, probably recognizable as training areas. And then you've got this gentleman in this heavy leather apron and standing in front of a forge with a wall full of horseshoes behind him and trying to, you know, reconcile these things as happening at the same time could be a little difficult from the modern standpoint. Yes. The weapons they had, of course, were the Model 1903 Springfield, the Colt 45 pistol, and by this time they had the Browning automatic rifle, 23 pounds, and they had the Browning water-cooled machine gun, mm-hmm. uh, which they adopt after evaluating uh, what the British used. There wasn't a whole lot of basic training. You were given a, a, a little bit of training, but then most trainings were conducted in the cavalry troops by the NCOs. It took two weeks to 20 days to teach soldiers horsemanship and care of horses. And in the cavalry, the horse was part of you. Mm-hmm. They started training you bareback first, then with a the really? saddle, then moving in a line of fours. Then you had to jump. And the, and the last thing, the most important thing, was how to arrive at a full gallop downhill. Uh, Which could be very dangerous if not trained accurately and correctly here, of course. And so, I mean, life in these training scenarios and the way they were here was important in its own right. But tell you what, we got to take this next break right now. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And also, what happened after this and particularly leading up to that other war we've been talking about uh, after this break. Again, John Hamilton, military historian, joining us here in studio. Back after this break with more on the El Paso History Radio Show here on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show, streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page, Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon-Baney, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com. 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral one epcom To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 
20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's mission trail, plus the Guadalupe mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing on News Radio 690 KTSM in this pre recorded episode. I'm your host, Andrew J. Polk. Thanks for tuning in, however, you may be doing so, be it on air, online, live streaming through the Free and Reliable iHeartRadio app, or over on our social media pages where this video and all of our previous ones are up and there for your viewing pleasure, including Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch, and our partner pages, including Remember and El Paso When. Of course, this week only El Paso Wink, you'll find another great set of local and in depth reports on a variety of issues affecting us here in the borderland. So El Paso's business journal, El Paso Inc., is available for home or business delivery to receive El Paso Inc., get it delivered right to your house, or even get your digital subscription. You can find them online at elpasoinc.com. You can bet I review it just about every week to stay on top of those important stories. But again, joining us here in studio right now, we are joined by uh, John Hamilton, a local military historian, and talking about the history of the 1st Cavalry Division here in El Paso, because, of course, there is a lot of history, I mean, both in the before the organization, even post it, but we were talking about, of course, you know, coming out of World War I, the ways that military forces were being considered was different on either side of the Atlantic, and, of course, as I was wondering about what would the future conflict be? I mean, there were a lot of different kind of competing ideas about how it should work. I mean, essentially going into World War I, there was this thought that the individual soldier with a rifle was the ultimate military platform. And then trenches and artillery and machine guns and things like that challenge that as a bit. But as tends to happen during peacetime, you kind of you fall back to what you know, so right. to speak, particularly military leadership. And what they knew was, you know, maneuver, fire maneuver, you know, regiments, cavalry specifically, even if they got organized into the divisions. And so as much as it kept on and we popped up some pictures of, uh, you know, how, you know, uh, division life worked in El Paso, this post picture. Of oh, there's, a, there they are gambling. A, and almost uh, – I mean, you can't really see much of them. I almost, for those who can't see it, call it like a doughboy-looking uniform. They definitely have on that hat, that distinctive kind of yeah, peaked ca- cavalry hat. Oh, the campaign hat was worn all the way up until and into World War II. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, of course, it was uh, dropped in favor of the, uh, the tin pot helmet and then, by, <laughs> right. and then by the new helmet that we adopted in World War II. So they, they played cards. They, they had sports. We mm-hmm. had sports teams that uh, squadrons and regiments had. And these teams would actually play uh, college teams in the area, and they'd beat them. Huh, uh, okay. so it was football, basketball, and, of course, horse shows. Oh, horse course. shows, horse shows, horse shows. And this picture is interesting because way off over onto the left side, you can see a model 1917 uh, tank. Really? It's a okay. portent for the future. It but, really um, is. But training was, was always a problem. Around here, uh, they didn't. They never had enough training land. They had Kastner Range, mm-hmm. uh, which was set up in 1926. They had Doña Ana Range, which was created right. by executive order all the way back to 1911. Uh, they did major exercises out here. They had a major exercise in the Toy Avail Balmeray area in 1938, where again they put the entire division out there, and this included scout cars and aviation. And the uh, scout okay. cars were starting to come uh, to be used here. This is a LaSalle stout, scout car on Fort Bliss in the 1930s. Uh, LaSalle produced them. Ford produced one. Uh, Pontiac produced one. Uh, there was a company called Marmot Harrington that produced one. And these were ultimately festooned with machine guns and then ultimately would be b- replaced with tracked vehicles, which the Army referred to as combat cars yeah so this is i mean this would truly be considered a car here the lasalle t1 you're talking about because yes. i mean it's got rubber wheels the axles fenders clearly visible but then you know the armor plating on the rest of it and it's one of those styles for those who can't see it of a it, probably a straight 
you know, yeah. six or eight engine in it and the, you know, fairing panels on the side of it here. So not yeah. the kind of, you know, wide hoods uh, that we're used to these days when we think about cars. And, uh, and interestingly enough, it does have a fashion of a turret on the top of it. Yes, but it otherwise, does. essentially taking the format, a slightly heavier duty, somewhere in between, you know, like a Model T and a tractor of the time, conceptually speaking here, and then putting a whole lot of, uh, you know, metal panels onto it to keep it from being, you know, uh, able to be hit by a bullet, though artillery, your mileage yeah, may it, vary. It was about quarter inch steel and mm-hmm. and yeah it would small arms it would deflect that reasonably uh reasonably well mm. um the division was rapidly being pulled almost kicking and screaming into the the modern age mm-hmm. there were a lot more quarters and new barracks that were built in 1938 uh during the depression with wpa funds uh ultimately this it, this is the first cavalry division east of Fort Bliss drawn up for uh, a full review. And you can see, if you look at it, there are a lot of vehicles out there. Yeah, going to give a slightly closer view to it here. I mean, previously we've seen, uh, let's just take a picture and imagine of it. This was, you know, 1916 when it was uh, yep. the 7th Cavalry returning that would then end up being making up the 1st Armored Division. But this picture, you're taking a little bit closer to it, showing that, yes, you can see, you know, parts of the cavalry off to, you know, lined up and in mass in the kind of right side of the picture there. But on the left side, making up, frankly, the bulk of the space is obviously vehicles. Vehicles, mechanized, a lot of trucks, of course, logistics talking about there. And of course, in the background, you can see, uh, you know, the actual territory of Fort Bliss itself here. But that, uh, again, like you're saying, uh, shades of things to come, so to speak, as it was that there was a lot more just bulk being taken up by the actual vehicles as opposed to just the flesh and bone, so to speak. Yes. In fact, in 1932, at... uh, at Camp Marfa, now called Fort D.A. Russell, uh, the 1st Cavalry Regiment, not the division, 1st Cavalry Regiment, mm-hmm. turned in all their horses and mules and entrained for Fort Knox, Kentucky, to essentially uh, become part of the 7th uh, Cavalry Brigade Mechanized, which mm-hmm. is the forerunner of the 1st Armored Division. And, of course, that's how part of this history connects to itself. But, of course, as we were talking about mobility is good mobility and warfare particularly if you're not getting bogged down in trenches makes sense and even then by the end of world war one mobility was proving itself to be valuable but protection right. had to come with it because yes. mobility without the ability to take a hit or two was seen as less useful and that's why i mean sure the whole idea of mechanized warfare was kind of coming through i think people underestimate how much mechanization was still happening even in the process of world war ii we often think of you know you know half tracks deuce and a half so all the oh, things yes. on the back end is being the major part of it but horses were definitely still around but more on the logistical side of things during world war ii particularly within europe itself but germans used germans used horses and constantly. horses and mules for logistical uh support they had a lot of horses uh In 1941, you had the general headquarters maneuvers that were conducted in Mm -hmm. Louisiana. These were two armies that were set against each other. Uh, The 1st Cavalry Division was packed up, sent sent there, and they they operated as part of the exercise. And initially, the division performed pretty well. Uh, But the 2nd Armed Division attacked them uh, one time under a smokescreen and dealt them a severe blow. And the result was they pretty much decided that um, horse slash mechanized forces proved no advantage in the maneuvers. And that was it. That was the death knell knell of the mounted horse cavalry. I mean, it makes a lot of sense here. But the fact that it continued on even until, you know, 1943, uh, that late here, as again, we have that picture here. This is of the, uh, I do believe, the final dismounted review in 1943. The Franklin Mountains clearly in the background and the many lined up different regiments yes. of the 1st uh, Cavalry Division shown there. That's and essentially, after this, they would get off their horses and, and never in this organization anyway, get back on them. They came back here after the maneuvers. In 1942, they turned in all horses and mules and uh, started exercising as a dismounted infantry division. Uh, the intent was to build a division. They did not change the structure. It was still a two-brigade, hmm. two-regiment structure. Interesting. Uh, and that this picture is at Armstrong Field, which is down the hill from the old officers' club. 
Uh, and uh, which is essentially, I mean, they might be confused to be like ponding areas these days, right? Yes, that's what it is now. And, yeah. it, and oh, yes, it will. Yes, we've seen it ponded there. By yeah, that's true. Certainly have. But this was a polo field, and uh, this was also a, a, it was big enough. At that time, you didn't have Highway 54 behind them. No, that's true. Uh, it was big enough to put the whole division out there. So this is the final review, 1943. They all moved to Camp Stoneman, California, and took ship to become part of the Southwest Pacific Theater under General Douglas MacArthur. And again, because of the changes in technology, and that's why even times, I mean, there are phrases that exist until this day of such as uh, Cav Scouts and yes. uh, certain phrases that they use that we're not going to repeat on air here because we get in trouble for them, such as, you ain't a cab, you ain't, mm. uh, yes. Point is that, that, is uh, that. Yeah. There, there is that kind of <laughs> sense that still continues on, but the actual technology and outmodedness of well, the horses themselves and the limits of them, at one point I wanted to at least mention here that we didn't get to before is that, of course, they had dealt with a lot of logistical issues, you know, ho- uh, you know, feeding and watering, uh, you know, horses at this point in time. Yeah. But it was not something that was able to be done at this mass totally indigenously in this area because, I mean, even we're mentioning back into the, like, the Victoria Wars that uh, the mounted horses were not able to survive the campaign because – I was actually happened to be out at uh, the Indian Cliffs Ranch Cattlemen's mm-hmm. earlier this week, and one of the stats that they put up is that the carrying capacity of that huge swath of land that that whole area encompasses, beyond just the restaurant, is about two to three cattle per acre. Yep. Because, sure, there is vegetation with heavy air quotes for those who can't see it, but it's you know sparse Thai desert vegetation that is not exactly lush grasses. No. Not, 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 not at all. Uh, it's very. This is very rough terrain. Um, the horse cavalry could not survive. In fact, they even uh, before World War II, they even tried a concept where you would put horses onto trucks, haul them uh, to a certain place, and then d- dismount them from the trucks and put them out and and to conduct their horse maneuvers. I mean, there were a lot of uh, interesting concepts they, that were they used. They tried that at, in Louisiana, and again, it didn't work. Uh, it was, it was, this was pretty much the end of horse cavalry. There was at there, least one concept, maybe not used locally, I'm aware of, where they considered bicycles instead to essentially replace the actually, actual horse. Yes, well, they did try bicycles here for a while, uh, and that didn't work very well no. either. Um, there are two remnants of the 1st Cavalry Division on Fort Bliss. At Memorial Circle, there is a plaque at the flagpole mm. uh, commemorating the 1st Cavalry Division service on Fort Bliss. And then, of course, you have the cavalry statue uh, of course. that's downtown that was gifted to the city by a retired uh, um, cavalry general officer and accepted by Mayor Tom Lee at the time. And that mm. sits right across from... It's in a triangular area. It's right across from the Scottish Rite. Of course. And we'll have to Still talk there. more about that here in a second. Got to take that last break. Coming out of this break, get into the last segment of the program, kind of wrapping up and some final thoughts about how this legacy continues to today. So stay tuned. More on the El Paso History Radio Show after this break here on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page, Remember in El Paso When run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom, at Lee Trevino and Pelicano, and see their website at missiondelray.com, 915-440-2140, for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. 
M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral one epcom To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA-TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. I've been talking again a lot this past couple hours with uh, John Hamilton, local military historian, talking about the history specifically of the 1st Cavalry Division on Fort Bliss, but also a lot about cavalry concepts of it and what was evident in our area through a lot of areas of just pre-modern and modern history. So we have now gotten through World War II, underway i mean of course december 7th 1941 and all those kind of considerations but by 1943 there was still technically cavalry even if they weren't exactly being deployed as cavalry they were getting modified it from being cavalry and turned into like you said infantry units and such but of course there was some facets of that that even after the war kind of survived if only in concept and some through lines we can draw from the first cavalry division to the now present on fort bliss first armored division right the 7th Cavalry uh, uh, Brigade mechanized that was at Fort Knox before World War II ultimately became the 1st Armored Division, mm-hmm. uh, constituted at Fort Knox in 1940. Uh, the 1st Cavalry Division that deployed from here into the Southwest Pacific, uh, they fought in New Guinea, the Bismarck Archipelago, and in the Philippines, Leyte mm-hmm. and Luzon. And they still retain that organization and this cavalry spirit. The units still were designated cavalry, mm. even if they didn't have the horses. Armored a, cavalry. Well, the, the armored cavalry. Is a little bit different, though. Yeah, that's true. But, and they served in Europe, pretty much. Mm. But uh, their mission was, um, was reconnaissance. Uh, they were fairly lightly armored. Uh, you didn't have heavy, heavy guns. Uh, it wasn't until much later that we established the Armored Cavalry Regiments, which were a combined arms unit. Mm. Uh, they had aviation, they had artillery, and they had tanks and armored personnel carriers. And and the 3rd ACR, of course, was here, 3rd Armored Cavalry mm-hmm. Regiment, was here between 1972 and 1993. And it is still part of the 1st Cavalry Division. And even today, the 1st Cav Division at Fort Hood still retains this mystique, this Mm -hmm. tradition. You have to go through a spur ride and earn your spurs, even though you're not going to ride horses. And they still have a horse platoon. Really? Yes. Wow. They they still have uh, some horse riders. Uh, uh, The cavalry division served in Korea, served Mm -hmm. in the Vietnam War. Uh, After Vietnam, they became something called a tricap division, which had them um, with an armored brigade, an air mobile brigade, and an air cavalry brigade. 
Mm, and this didn't okay. last very long. It was kind of hard to do, and they came to the decision it was probably best to just make them an armored division. So that's what they were. And now they are a heavy division, uh, armor mechanized at Fort Hood, Texas. Uh, deployed to Iraq and, uh, and, and fought. Uh, and it's well to remember that ultimately in October 2005, the 1st Cavalry Division came back to Fort Bliss mm-hmm. in the form of the, the 4th Brigade, 1st Cavalry Division, the Long Knives who stood up out here. They deployed to Iraq in December 2006 and came back to Fort Bliss in 2007. And then it, and, uh, about six months later, they reflagged as part of the 1st Cavalry Division at Fort Hood mm-hmm. and moved on. And, of course, then that was when the 1st Armored Division was moving in here right. from Europe. Uh, so it can be said that the 1st Cavalry Division on Fort Bliss brought Fort Bliss into the 20th century with much, much more training areas, uh, range space, uh, a lot more buildings, uh, a lot more quarters. The first NCO quarters in the Army were built there in 1934. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, they are still there. They are the small red brick buildings that mm-hmm. are inside, and they are junior enlisted quarters now and still occupied, still used. The one you can see on what would be considered a old Fort Bliss, I guess yes. you could say, the parade grounds and surrounding well, yes, it. Yes, they're, 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 we, 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 we started referring to Fort Bliss as old Fort Bliss and new Fort Bliss, Bliss. And a previous commanding general said, no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> it's East Fort Bliss and West, West Fort Bliss. Bliss. That is that is true. I don't want to get but, in trouble with any but, generals today. <laughs> but, oh, no, they, they, we won't get in any trouble. Uh, the, the Of course, and West, West Fort Bliss is the historical district. It's mm. Much of it is still there. Uh, much of it is still in use. The quarters oh, yeah. that George Patton lived in, 222 um, Sheridan Road, is still there and still occupied by a senior officer. Um, the, the ranges existed for the anti-aircraft when mm-hmm. we brought in four regiments of anti-aircraft in right. 1940. And that's when the post started to transition into uh, the huge air defense post it was and arguably still is. Still is. Still some research facilities I'm aware of here. Right. And, of course, the continuing legacy of that includes, of course, both maneuvering area and the yes. ability to fire just, I don't, yes. I'm not aware of anything in the Army's arsenal outside of like, you know, ICBMs, which doesn't really count, no. that couldn't be fired on any of the ranges. Because, I mean, once you combine Fort Bliss, you know, uh, McGregor Range, uh, Holloman Air Force Base, and White Sands Missile yes. Range, you end up with, to my understanding, the largest contiguous yes. military training area and usable area in the continental United States. That is correct. You can fire, and, and a lot of uh, a lot of work is being done now on precision fires. Oh, yeah. So that you can fire a missile from 40 miles away and have it land in a shoebox up somewhere on uh, on White Sands Missile Range. Mm-hmm. So you can shoot something from McGregor, and it can fly up and, and hit a target at, at, uh, with very great accuracy on White Sands. Over the horizon, so um, to speak, here. So, so, again, the traditions and the concepts and the history still continues to this day yes. with a lot of stuff from the history of, well, the military conflicts of this area and, of course, of the 1st Cavalry Division here. We're going to have to leave it there for today because we're out of time for this program. Again, having joined us here in studio, John Hamilton, military historian. Thank you very much for talking to us about all of these and some of the great pictures involving it here today. Very good, sir. Appreciate we'll, it. We'll see each other again, I'm sure. Oh, I am positive. And thank you for joining us here. We'll be back next week with more on the El Paso History Radio Show. Been your host, Andrew J. Polk. Have a great weekend, y'all.